If scientists can create a rabbit that glows in the dark, is this a good thing? If they can help the environment by mixing the genes of different species, would that be right? And if they can make a chicken that grows without feathers, is this going too far? Since time began, evolution has produced weird and wonderful creatures. Now man can do the same. Science has allowed us to unlock the secrets of life itself. So are we, as some believe, on the verge of a terrible nightmare in a world gone mad? Or could genetic engineering be a force for good to help create a world where nobody goes hungry? Thank you very much. Where our bodies regenerate? This is not tomorrow's world. It's happening now. If all the plants and animals that have been created by science were gathered together on one farm, then this is what it would look like. The farm is imaginary, but all the plants and creatures you're about to see are real. Welcome to our animal farm. We've placed two people on our farm to guide us around. Scientist Olivia Judson is a strong supporter of genetic engineering and wants to persuade you that it really can improve the world. I'm a biologist. I spend my time learning about animals, plants, fungi, bacteria. I find genetic engineering amazing. It's a new frontier of science that has the possibility of transforming all of our lives. For me, genetic engineering isn't so much frightening as inspiring. It opens up a world of wonder. Food journalist Giles Corum is a passionate advocate for organic farming. He finds what's being done in the name of science a real cause for concern. As a food writer, I spend a lot of my time seeking out the best natural food that I can, organically grown fruit and vegetables, free-range meat and eggs. And as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to feeding the planet, nature has made a pretty good job of it. So when I hear about the brave new world of genetic engineering and the franken food that it produces, it strikes me as completely pointless and, to be honest, very scary. Olivia Judson and Giles Corran are about to see some plants and animals that are truly beyond belief. Are these modern-day Frankenstein's monsters? Or could they transform our lives and the world for the better? For them and us, it's time to decide. Giles's tour around our farm begins in the cow sheds. He's going to meet some extraordinary creatures, the Schwarzeneggers of the cow world. Well, I found the whole experience deeply disturbing. They call it natural selection, but it's been designed by men to exploit animals for their own ends. Whilst to Giles, this seems shocking and unnatural. Scientist Olivia Judson has a very different view of what's natural in the first place. It's always fascinated me that what we think of as natural is often anything but. Take this farmhouse treasure trove, the classic image of nature's bounty. But nothing on this table is simply the product of natural evolution. We've been genetically manipulating fruit and vegetables for thousands of years. Take the carrot. Crisp, juicy, orange. But until about 300 years ago, carrots usually looked like this, white. The Dutch selectively bred orange carrots as a tribute to their royal family, the House of Orange. The pink grapefruit we eat are all clones of one original mutant grapefruit. We've forgotten that the potato was originally poisonous. The wheat was once just a scrawny wild grass. Farmers have been interfering with nature for thousands of years. 
and on our farm, they are still at it. Next, Olivia is about to meet a new kind of chicken, which may come as a bit of a surprise. These chickens may look normal, but they've been bred to grow as fat and as fast as possible. Greedy chickens have heart rates as high as 300 beats a minute. They have a high metabolism and find it difficult to cool down. In charge of solving the problem of overheated chickens is geneticist Dr. Abigdor Kahana. As long as they are kept in cool environment, this is not a problem at all because this heat is dissipated through the legs, through the face, and that's sufficient. However, once this pro the progeny of these birds are reared in the tropics in hot conditions, because the gradient in temperature between the body temperature and the ambience is so small, they can hardly dissipate the heat. So it's as if I go to the tropics wearing a fur coat. That's right. And I just can't get cool enough. That's right. Since I'm a geneticist, I was looking for a genetic solution. That means instead of cooling the environment of, the, of chickens with feathers, is helping them feel cool by just removing the feathers. So I decided to go to the extreme situation of developing broilers without feathers at all. Can we have a look? Sure. Let's go. All right. Chickens without the gene to make feathers. Hey. I'm fascinated to see what they look like. It's hot in here. Yeah, it is hot. And here they are, the featherless chickens. They look like miniature dinosaurs. What we have here is that's the original mutant. This is a female. She's amazingly smooth. Yeah. It's quite extraordinary. This is the male. So and as is... you can see, no scales on the feet. Right. That's why the mutation is called scaleless. They've got little claws on the, on the ends of their wings. You can certainly imagine them as, as little, little miniature dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, sexually mature males bright red. become red. It's an interaction between the sex hormone and the light. I see. Which create this uh, red so pigment. So it's testosterone plus light yeah, makes, turns you red. That's right. These are adult birds. This is mature body size. They will never be bigger than this. When I started, I started to cross birds like these ones. With the ones? With the ones that we saw, well, they try to flop. <laughs> they still know how to flop. I they're rather sweet. Having successfully bred small featherless chickens, Dr. Kahana wanted to see if he could create a big commercial-sized bird. And that was the challenge, and indeed we managed to do it, as you can see here. <laughs> He's <laughs> huge. This is an He's adult male. He's absolutely huge. This male is identical in body size to the males that we saw over there in the other house, which have full feathers. The only thing that we changed is that we took advantage of this gene, the scaleless gene, that eliminates or avoids the development of the feathers. But, and by this, doing this, we allowed these birds to grow nicely and comfortably in hot conditions. These chickens are the result of Dr. Kahana's selective breeding program. And after six generations of mating the chickens with the featherless genes, this is what we've ended up with. I can imagine most people's reactions at seeing these chickens is one of revulsion. But if you were a chicken in 100 degree heat, you wouldn't want feathers, believe me. And anyway, they're not the first animal bred to have their natural covering removed. Look at pigs. Wild boar are furry. And even we humans were once apes, entirely covered in hair. So perhaps they're not as weird as they first seem. What is the future of these chickens? Are we going to see them in our supermarkets soon? Hopefully in the supermarkets in the tropical countries, in Nigeria, in Indonesia, where it's very hot. For so these farmers, it's easier and more efficient because, because there's no have, need... You don't no, have to pluck them. That's right. There's no need to pluck them. The proportion of meat on these birds is higher. So, so featherless chickens in the tropics, they grow faster that's than right. a bird with feathers because they don't, they, they don't get held up by the fact they're getting too hot. They're healthier, they cost less because you don't have expensive housing. It sounds fantastic. That's right. Good for the person, good for the bird. Selective breeding is just the first tool 
in our quest to control the natural world. But it still takes generations to accomplish and is quite imprecise. The big breakthrough really came when scientists could identify individual genes. Not only that, but they developed the technology to extract them. One of the great discoveries of the last 20 years is that you can move a gene from one species into another entirely different one, which gives us almost limitless possibilities. That's right. On our farm, it's time to enter the world of transgenics and genetic modification. It's time to enter the rabbit hutch. The man in charge of transgenics is Dr. Hudebeen. In the hutch, he's created dozens of transgenic rabbits. So what does it mean, transgenic rabbits? If you look at the word transgene, this means that a gene was transferred, a foreign gene was transferred to the animal. So which gene have they got? Well, it comes from a, a jellyfish from Pacific Ocean. In case you missed that, Dr. Hudevin has successfully used transgenics to insert a jellyfish gene into a rabbit. And what does the gene do? Uh, the gene gives a green color to the jellyfish and then green color to the rabbits. So the rabbits glow green in the dark? Yes, absolutely. Can I see? Oh, sure. Charged up with blue ultraviolet light, and viewed through special glasses, the skin and the eyes of these rabbits glow green, just like a jellyfish. Look. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yeah. extremely green. So the That's difference amazing. is uh, <laughs> great because they have red eyes yes. in, in normal light and, and green uh, it, <laughs> with this light. It looks quite peculiar, I will yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is no trick of the light. These rabbits' eyes and skin really do glow green. It's amazing what he's done. This is transgenics in action. Scientists have managed to isolate a tiny bit of jellyfish DNA that makes them fluoresce, known as the GFP gene. Dr. Hudebin has simply taken that gene and inserted it into bacteria. As the bacteria reproduce, the gene is multiplied. And then these genes are injected into the fertilized egg of a rabbit. Dr. Hudebin then places the egg into the mother. As the egg grows to form the rabbit embryo, it copies the fluorescing gene into every cell. 31 days later, you've got fluorescent bunnies. You may be surprised to hear that Dr. Hudebin does all this with jellyfish genes he orders off the internet. Because it's, I find it still impressive. You know that tube, very small, and you tiny. have a very, very tiny drop Yes. And this is the gene itself that was injected in these animals. And uh, with that small quantity that you can see... Which there, is you, absolutely you, tiny. You can micro-inject hundreds of embryo. Dr. Hudebin has a fresh litter for me to take a look at. If we want to look and see them green, to take the spectacle and... Uh... The effect of the GFP gene is even more pronounced in the newly born babies. Can I, can mm. I hold one? Oh, sure. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Most of them are green, but one or two of them are not green because the, uh, the father was green, but not the mother. So uh, statistically, half of them are green and uh, the second half is not. But why on earth, I hear you say, make animals that glow in the dark? Well, these rabbits are being bred to help medical researchers across the world track the movement of cells. The jellyfish genes are being used like a fluorescent marker pen. By tagging certain cells with the glowing jellyfish genes, scientists can work out which cells go where after an organ transplant. The technology is helping us find treatments for problems like blindness and bone disease. I think it's amazing that you can take a gene from a jellyfish and put it into a bacteria or a mushroom or a rabbit, and it works. It does the same thing it did in the jellyfish. And Jellyfish and rabbits have been separated for more than 600 million years, and yet the jellyfish gene still works. I think that's incredible. So transgenics can be useful for medical research. But what happens when it hits your dinner table? For our next stop, 
Let's head to the fish farm to meet the genetically modified fish, our very own super salmon. In the fish tanks on our farm, Joe McGonagall is using transgenics to create a salmon that grows extra fast for your dining pleasure. So down here in this tank, we have um, transgenic fish that are a year old. During this period of their lives, they're growing about four to six times faster than standard salmon grow. We can take this out and we can compare it with a, with a standard non-transgenic salmon. Um, and you can take a look and see how they compare, uh, both for size and for condition. After just one year's growth, Joe's salmon are four times larger than non-GM salmon of the same age. Well, what we have are two same-age fish. Uh, the, the larger one, as you can see, is the transgenic that we've just taken out of the tank. These fish are virtually identical, except for one has a transgene. It grows faster during this first year of life. Traditionally, a salmon only grows in warm water. But as soon as the water gets cold in winter, the gene controlling the salmon's growth switches off and the fish stops growing. Not anymore. Joe takes the genetic switch which controls growth from another species of fish that grows in cold water. He inserts that into the salmon egg. The presence of this genetic switch means the new salmon now grows all year round, whatever the water temperature. Joe really does seem to love his fish. As you can see here, these are beautiful fish. There's, there's virtually nothing uh, wrong with them in any way. They're uh, streamlined, they're torpedo shaped. There is virtually no deformity. They look exactly like conventional fish. This is not like a bodybuilder situation or people using steroids in order to bulk up. These fish are essentially producing what they need internally under their own genetic control. Joe sees himself as a farmer of the future. He really seems to believe that using transgenics to create these super salmon could make salmon farming less damaging to the environment and protect the few remaining stocks of wild salmon. You can reduce the environmental footprint of conventional salmon farming in a couple of ways. One is that these fish are more efficient at feed conversion. They gain about 30% more weight per gram of food they eat compared to conventional salmon. And as a result, they also produce about 30% less waste. That waste would otherwise end up in the water column or on the bottom of the ocean. In each of these trays, Joe's got enough eggs to grow super salmon on an industrial scale. Each one of these contains about 10,000 eggs, and uh, there's uh, something in the neighborhood of 160 of them. Uh, each one is a unique family, and each one uh, can be bred forward into the future. But what on earth would happen if one of these monster salmon escaped and swam off to breed with ordinary fish? The concerns that the transgene is out there and there's no calling it back, you've changed the world forever. Now, in point of fact, the fish are sterile. They can't breed at all. There's no possibility of a transgene that exists in an Atlantic salmon escaping from the species. So because the salmon are sterile, Joe's certain there's no danger of the gene getting out and causing chaos. Novelists get paid for imagining those kinds of things. Um, fish breeders get paid for producing a fish that can provide food uh, into the future without the problems of over-harvesting stocks that will frankly disappear if we keep hitting them. Here on the farm, super salmon aren't the only genetically modified animals that could help save the environment. For our next appointment, we're heading to the pigsty to meet some creatures who could help us out of a sticky situation. bacon as much as the next person. But the amount of pork we eat is causing serious problems. Last year, we killed more than two billion pigs. And these creatures provide more dietary protein, more cheaply, to more people than any other animal. But all this consumption comes at a cost. 
animal agriculture is a major consumer of the natural environment. That is, the impact on the atmosphere, upon water utilization, and in particular, pig agriculture or hog agriculture produces copious amounts of manure. Manure, it's a natural product, but on an industrial scale, it's a serious environmental pollutant. And poo from pigs is particularly toxic. Pig manure has a very high level of phosphorus within it from normal diets through normal pigs. And that phosphorus usually is more than is required by crops produced on land fertilized with pig manure. Pig manure is packed with phosphorus because pigs simply can't digest it. And this excess is causing some serious damage. It runs off into the water supply, causing the overgrowth of algae and killing fish. It seems an impossible problem of biology, but John Phillips has found a way to fix it. A very simple and effective solution to the environmental problems caused by high phosphorus pig manure found right behind these doors. To tackle the problem, John has created something he calls the EnviroPig. This animal looks normal, but it's anything but. These pigs are unlike any other pigs in the world. They're different because they carry a very special gene that allows them to digest all of the phosphorus in their diet. The gene is constructed in the laboratory that we use. The remarkable thing about the EnviroPigs is that they carry a man-made gene, which John has created from scratch. One part comes from E. coli bacteria, which produces an enzyme that can break down phosphorus. And the other comes from a mouse, which produces a genetic switch that allows this special enzyme to be made in saliva. These two bits of DNA were combined to form a new compound gene, which was then inserted into a fertilized pig egg. Now every time John's pigs eat and produce saliva, they also make the phosphorus-busting enzyme, helping to make their poo more environmentally friendly. The aim ultimately, we think, is that the global environment would be best served if every pig could digest all of its organic phosphorus in its diet the way these pigs do. So John wants every pig in the world to be an enviro pig. I think it's an idea with merit, but he's encountered a lot of obstacles. There are many people out in the community uh, that do have concerns about transgenic changes in animals. And some of these people have gone about intentionally frightening the public about this technology. So we have an uphill battle uh, in terms of people's perceptions. This is an effective way of dealing with a serious environmental problem. It's simple, it can be propagated very rapidly. Any other technology cannot touch this in terms of the rapidity of its application on the farm or the extent of the change that can occur as a result of the technology. Nothing comes close to this. All over the farm, scientists are discovering that genetic modification is an immensely powerful tool but it's also a controversial one. Olivia Judson is convinced that we shouldn't be afraid of it. I personally would much rather have, uh, would much rather eat an organism that has been genetically modified to grow fast than one that has been injected with a lot of hormones to grow fast. I certainly would have no objection to eating an animal that has been genetically modified. I mean, what is a gene? It's an instruction to make a protein. It, it's not anything mystical. I think to a lot of people it probably is something mystical. But it's not. I mean, there is nothing mystical about a gene. We know what it is, we can describe it, we can build them. There is nothing mysterious, and all it does is contain the instruction for making a protein. You know, you add one, you take one away, so what? But having understood how it works, to then start changing it and meddling with it is another step, isn't it? Well, we already have. I mean, nothing in this countryside, in this landscape, is natural. It's been modified by us. We haven't done it precisely, but we certainly have altered which sheep are growing, which grass is growing. We just don't have such a thing as a natural landscape in, in most of the world. I mean, it's just complete, you know, it, it, it's a fantasy. We've created it. What 
Giles and so many other people don't seem to appreciate is that genetic engineering is one of the most highly regulated technologies in the world. It's so highly regulated that even when GM could really help save lives, we're not allowed to use it. Absurdly, this greenhouse is classed as a biohazard containment facility, the sort of thing where you'd keep a sample from Mars. To stop what some people call genetic pollution, cross-pollination, none of these plants are allowed into the open air for a moment. But inside are simply new strains of the crops billions of people eat every day. What's more, every cutting is meticulously catalogued and recorded. The point is, scientists working here have been trying to cure a condition that kills two and a half million people a year. Vitamin A deficiency. It's a huge problem. Half the world population gets almost all their nutrition from rice. But unfortunately, rice doesn't have in it a set of simple chemicals called carotenoids. That's the stuff that gives color to vegetables like carrots and peppers. Our bodies use carotenoids from vegetables to make vitamin A. And if you don't get enough vitamin A, you have real problems. Vitamin A deficiency suppresses the immune system, but before it does that, it makes individuals blind. Most of the children who are affected are less than five. Most of them die within two years of becoming blind. People suffering from vitamin A deficiency die from diseases which healthy people can survive. So vitamin A deficiency kills two and a half million people a year. That's equivalent to a 9-11 every 12 hours, to a tsunami every month, to 250 people dying during the course of one hour television program. So the scientists set to work to see if they could manage to make rice high in vitamin A by persuading it to produce the carotenoids. Their science was pioneering. They identified not one, or two, but three genes. Two from the daffodil and one from a bacteria, which they thought would help produce carotenoids. They then tried to insert all three of these into rice DNA. In 1999, after years of trial and error, they finally managed to create rice that produced beta-carotene. They could tell that this was being produced because the genetically engineered rice was colored yellow. They christened it golden rice. That was amazing science, it still is amazing science. At the time, no other genetically modified plant had more than one gene expressing. They put three in and turned on a pathway. It's been a long road to perfect their plants, but now a bowl of golden rice can provide an individual with enough vitamin A to meet their daily needs. But absurdly, golden rice is still locked in greenhouses like this. Dr. Adrian Dubok finds this completely frustrating, and I can understand why. Genes occur in all the food we eat. They occur in all organisms. Biology is a most powerful tool, and there's nothing to be frightened of in this technology. The history shows it's extremely safe. It's the most regulated technology of any technology that's ever been introduced. So how can rich people in Europe stand in the way of choice for poor people in the developing world, especially when standing in the way of that choice kills them? Golden Rice sums up what I find so frustrating. There may be issues about who exploits this technology and there have been worries about cross-pollination, but the basic underlying fear remains irrational. The science at the heart of this is so effective and the plant scientists who've made the breakthroughs are trying to make the world a better place. Once scientists have gone to the trouble of improving on evolution, either through GM or traditional breeding, the next question is how to preserve their success. And now we get to the most extraordinary technique scientists are using on our farm. Cloning. You've probably heard of Dolly the sheep, but what you may not know is that since then, scientists have created whole herds of cloned cows, pigs, and flocks of sheep. For our next stop, we're going to meet the prize-winning herd of longhorn cattle, an entire paddock of clones. The 
adult cows are surrogate mothers and all of their calves are clones. In this pen, I have uh, clones of five different animals. When you say surrogate mothers, did they carry the eggs? That they... they carried the embryos, the complete gestation, and gave birth to these calves. Everything is as it would be if they, if were they normal. weren't right. It, well, if they weren't clones, so. You don't like to use the word. <laughs> well, well I, you know, looking there, you, you know, you can't say that they're abnormal. No, they, no, they look very healthy know. and yes. Although they're beautiful and lovely, and I always love seeing cows and particularly small ones. I'm slightly disappointed that they're not all identical. You know, cloning, you can't guarantee that they're going to look identical. You're just guaranteeing that the genetics are identical. That's the purpose of cloning is is to provide the exact genetic. I kind of expected them all to be running along together in rows, you know, like finishing at the same time in a race. Yes, like a mirror yes. Mirror image of the same cow over and over. So it's not quite like that. No, it, it's not. You know, like I said, they uh, they'll act similar, but um, they don't know they're a clone. And each calf has its own personality. So just how do you create a clone? Expert cloner Earl Huang is keen to show Olivia just how it's done. Uh, it's still kind of hard to see. Let me see if I can get it. Today we're working with bovine. So it's a cow egg? Yes. These eggs come from a slaughterhouse, and what I'm basically doing is taking out all the DNA and creating a blank for the uh, uh, actual cloning process to, to begin. So in order to clone, you need an empty egg. Exactly. And so you're plunging this, this glass pipette into the egg and just suctioning out the DNA. Yes. It's an extremely delicate operation. It is. You have to be, you have to have good hand-eye coordination and you have to be gentle with the eggs. You don't want don't to kill them. And that's what's amazing about cloning. It doesn't require particularly complicated chemistry, just a microscope, a very sharp glass needle, and incredibly steady hands. And I'll, I'll go in with the pipette. And draw it up like juices from a turkey. I have to say, it's extremely it's fascinating to see it. Next, Earl has to hoover up the cells containing the DNA of the animal he wants to clone. These are cells grown from the skin of the animal that we want to clone. Exactly. It amazes me that you can put a, a cell from a grown-up animal into an empty egg and something happens. Well, the cell basically con uh, contains the whole genetic makeup of that animal. You now insert the DNA of the animal you want to clone into the empty egg. One cell into each egg. You can see there's a little, a little pocket of space. What I'll do is puncture the egg and just carefully oh. deposit the cell in there. Last of all, you need to wake up the egg containing the new DNA. All it takes is a spark of electricity. Earl may make it look easy, but in fact, it's immensely difficult to pull off in practice. Dolly the sheep was the only survivor of 300 attempts. But if you can master it, the rewards are huge, because once you've found your perfect animal, you can create a clone and repeat it time after time, like a biological photocopier. And it's not only farmers who have their eye on this technology. For our next appointment, let's head to the stables to meet a world-famous sporting duo who have just made scientific history. Hi. 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 And this, this is, is Scamper. So what's so special about this horse? Um, he's a 10-time world champion barrel racing horse, and he won those 10 championships consecutively. And what is barrel racing exactly? Barrel racing is a timed event around three barrels in a clover leaf pattern. It's timed. So the barrels are in the ground? The barrels are 50-gallon uh, drums. There's mm -hmm. three of them set uh, in a clover leaf pattern and uh, it's timed electronically right into the hundredth of a second. And when you ride round and round and round? As fast as you can. Who was you riding him? I, yeah, I was the only one who rode him. Um, Scamper was a bronc when he was young. Um, and a bronc? He, yeah, he, uh, he, bucked, what, he, he bucked a lot of people off. <laughs> There's no telling what kind of abuse he had. 
being that he was so mean. <laughs> he went through three or four sale yards. Nobody wanted him. So Scamper had a troubled childhood. But just when everyone else had given up on him, Charmaine came to his rescue. Oh. It's like sea biscuit. It's a yeah. proper romance. Yeah, and I was a little 11-year-old girl that just was horse crazy. And, and uh, he met me for the first time, and we just basically fell in love. It was a match, match made in heaven. Love at first sight. Scamper made me who I was and what I was, and he did. You know, I lived every day of my life with him for 10 years while I was winning a world championship. Never left him. But all good things come to an end. So when did when did Scamper stop racing? He's been retired for around 10 years now. So when he was retired, did you carry on racing on, on different horses? Yes. And they weren't as good? Oh, no. What was it they didn't have, the other horses? They didn't have whatever Scamper was made of. Scamper's a world-famous horse, and in theory, his genetics, basically his sperm, are worth a fortune. But in fact, it's more complicated than that. And Scamper never had any children? No, he's a gelding. Oh, poor fellow. And when you met him, he was, a, he was already a he gelding? He was already a gelding. So what do you do when you've got a million-dollar racehorse and no way to reproduce him? Well, here on the farm, there's an obvious solution. So you can't have children, so you've decided to clone him? We decided to clone him so we could get that same genetics. How did it come about? How, how did they clone Scamper? They took cells from him or...? Yeah, they, uh, they took a biopsy, just a little small amount of tissue from Scamper, and, uh, of course, we gene-banked him, and then when they had the science to... You gene-banked him before they had the science? Yes. And then, what, they, they, they gave you a call when they had the technology? Yes. Um, when they knew they had it right, they said, OK, we're ready to go. Scamper's little clone is named Clayton and the champion is about to meet his younger self. There's Clayton. Oh. Well, he looks pretty normal, but this is crazy stuff, and I reckon it must be even weirder for Scamper. Have they met many times before? They, this is the second time they've met, and Scamper's not real fond of Clayton. He likes his mama. Really? Yes, so he's protecting uh, the mama from the baby. Is he? Is that a kind of, that's a man thing? That's a scamper thing. Is this chopping mouth, is that a threat? Yes. <laughs> so scamper doesn't think much of his clone. But what about Charmaine? Do you see similarities between the two already? He carries himself the same. He has the same arch in his neck. Um, he's just very confident. The first time I saw him, I just couldn't take my eyes off of him. I just makes the hair on the back of your neck stand out to, to think to think that this is how Scamper was when he was a baby and and it's a it's real emotional he doesn't look identical I mean maybe that, is that because he's young is that is that what Scamper looked like when he was um, a kid? I didn't see Scamper when he was a baby but confirmation wise the shoulder the the hips everything looks the same from what I understand the white migrates in the womb so mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with the uh, DNA. Clayton's been created to do what Scamper can't, produce sperm, which will then be sold to other breeders. But what if it was Scamper's tough childhood, more than his DNA, that took him to the top? We obviously don't know how much of his past life made him try as hard as what he did, kind of like the kids that grow up in a bad part of town and, mm -hmm. and they knew they had to overcome a lot, kind of the same thing. I guess only time will tell. But while Charmaine is delighted about Clayton's arrival, not everyone is thrilled that he's here. We've had a few uh, negative comments. Um, Such as? I think that we're playing God. But now that we've uh, created Clayton, now what if they clone Osama bin Laden? <laughs> That's what they said? Yes. <laughs> God, how many? That would be scary. But he wouldn't be much good at barrel racing, would he, Osama? In spite of the sceptics, Charmaine's certain she's done the right thing. I think the people who really don't understand the science behind it may uh, oppose it, but the reasons I did it were, yeah, I love Scamper, but I have a passion for great horses and their ability. Mm -hmm. And I've struggled with other horses past him that had so many physical problems mm -hmm. from competing that it's hard to get past all that. And if we can start breeding some horses mm -hmm. that stayed as sound as him, mm -hmm. then uh, I think we're doing a, a real noble thing. 
So cloning is an irresistibly powerful tool for some breeders. And it's been around a lot longer than you might think. Cloning, to a lot of people, I think, suggests a Xerox copy. It's exactly not, what it suggests to me. Yeah. And that's not, that's obviously not what it is. I mean, technically speaking, an, an identical twin is a clone. Apples, for example, are all clones. Almost all fruit is made by grafting, so as to avoid the, uh, the, the genetic lottery. Um, well, every apple is, a, is, is, is there's, no, there's no unique apples. Um, well, we could grow them from seed, but then they'd taste horrible and be useful only for making cider. In and what it, sense is it a clone? Apples are grown by grafting, so that you don't have to take the risk of sex. Sex breaks up good gene combinations. The offspring of an apple that tastes good often don't taste very good because the genes that made the, your apple taste very good have been shuffled up. In that case, let's accept the fact that the cloning of an apple is not especially scary, is it? That's not the thing that worries people. It's cloning, uh, it's cloning people, it's cloning, cloning cattle for, the, for, for eating that scares people. Why? We don't know what the long-term dangers are likely to be. Is the species not strengthened by constant cross-fertilisation? Are we not storing up some time bomb? Uh, we might have a problem if every cow on the planet was a clone, but we're not... I mean, that's not what's going to happen. Would you eat a, a clone? Yes. Really? Absolutely. Right. Would you? Uh, I would eat apple sauce made from a cloned apple with a normal pig, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't eat a cloned pig. So Giles wouldn't eat a clone, but as his tour around the farm ends, are there any of the animals on our farm he would be prepared to give the taste test to? They don't look very different dead than alive, do they? I mean, they're, they're still all muscle. There's almost no difference between the animal with the skin on and the skin off. <laughs> you, you're, quite right. you're, you're quite right, yeah, that's right. I mean, you would say, if you didn't know that this had been selectively bred over 100 years to get to this stage, uh, and that it was just an animal randomly killed, and so you would say that that animal must have had a very, a very strenuous life. I mean, you know, that, that, why has this animal got all these muscles? It must be for a reason. But then the meat wouldn't be very good because that, that meat would be very tough, you mm -hmm. see? So the beauty of the Belgian Blue is that because of that double muscle, all the food is converted into um, muscle, but these muscles remain very tender, you see? Now for the moment of truth. Has all the effort been worthwhile? What will this ultra-lean, double-muscled meat actually taste of? That is very, very lean. No fat at all. So this uh, double-muscled Belgian blue steak is not genetically modified. It's been specifically selected over generations, 30 or 40 years. It's all muscle, there's no fat. Generally speaking, English people like, like me I generally think that you need fat on a, on a steak to give it the flavour, that that's where the interest lies. But can they really taste of anything at all? I'm about to find out. Thank you very much. Otherwise, yeah. Doesn't taste of anything at all. Oh, very chewy. It's a bit like biting your tongue. I don't know why you put all that time and energy into this. Mm. Tastes like horse. So the Belgian blues aren't to everyone's taste. But as our tour around the farm comes to a close, Olivia has one last surprise up her sleeve. And it's one of the most revolutionary concepts we've encountered. You will never have seen this before. One possible use of genetic technology is to just get rid of the animal altogether and just grow steaks in vats. Um, I know this, this looks a bit unappetizing. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, Depends what it is. Well, it's a prototype steak in a vat. This is meat grown in a Petri dish, a burger from mince that has never been part of a cow or bull. It opens up a world where no animals need live or die to feed you. It's from, grown from stem cells. It's, a, it's, it's grown from stem cells? Not human stem cells. Cow stem cells. Right. 
This prototype non-animal burger may look slightly odd, but you could just be looking at the future of food. You could eventually, you could just grow a hamburger in a vat or grow a large piece of breast meat in a vat and get rid of the animal altogether. And so if you're worried about the ethical treatment of animals, you might then want to start eating meat again. Surely you couldn't make one of these tasty. Probably the life of the animal is what makes the thing tasty, isn't it? I mean... I have to do the experiment. Next time on Animal Farm, we look at how biotechnology is changing the world of medicine. We meet the cows that are milked for their blood, the sheep with humanized organs, and the mice who can regenerate themselves. Um, well, we, we have uh, gone to all this trouble to prepare this food, so uh, might as well eat it. Do you want to start with the... Uh, do you want to carve the super salmon? Well, cheers. To genetic modification. So, Mother Nature. 